Mrs. Owens waited outside the funeral chapel. It had been decreed over 40 years before that the building, in appearance a small church with a spire, was a listed building of historical interest. The town council had decided that it would cost too much to renovate it, a little chapel in an overgrown graveyard that had already become unfashionable. So they had padlocked it and waited for it to fall down. Ivy covered it, but it was solidly built and it would not fall down the century. The child had fallen asleep in Mrs. Owen's arms. She rocked it gently, sang to it an old song one of her mother had sung to her when she was a baby herself. Back in the days when men had first started to wear powdered wigs, the song went, Sleep, my little baby, sleep until you waken. When you're grown, you'll see the world, if I'm not mistaken. Kiss a lover, dance a measure, find your name, and bury treasure. And Mrs. Owens sang all that before she discovered that she had forgotten how the song ended. She had a feeling that the final line was something in the way of, and some hairy bacon. But that might have been another song altogether. So she stopped, and instead she sang him the one about the man in the moon, who came down too soon. And after that she sang, in her warm country voice, a more recent song about a lad who put in his thumb and pulled out a plum. And she had just started a long ballad about a young country gentleman whose girlfriend had, for no particular reason, poisoned him with a dish of spotted eels when Silas came around the side of the chapel carrying a cardboard box. Here we go, Mistress Owens, he said. Lots of good things for a growing boy. We can keep it in the crypt, eh? The padlock fell off in his hand and he pulled open the iron door. Mrs. Owens walked inside looked dubiously at the shelves and at the old wooden pews tipped up against a wall. There was milled wheat boxes of old parish records in one corner and an open door that revealed a Victorian flush toilet and a basin with an old tap in the other. The infant opened his eyes and stared. We can put the food in here, said Silas. It's cool and the food will keep longer. He reached into the box, pulled out a banana. And what would that be when it was at home, asked Mrs. Owens, eyeing the yellow and brown object suspiciously. It's a banana, a fruit from the tropics. I believe you peel off the outer covering, said Silas, like so. The child, nobody, wriggled on Mrs. Owens' arms, and she let it down to the flagstones. It toddled rapidly to Silas, grasping his trouser leg and held on. Silas passed at the banana. Mrs. Owens watched the boy eat banana, she said dubiously. Never heard of them. Never. What's it taste like? I've absolutely no idea, said Silas, who consumed only one food, and it was not bananas. You could make up a bed in here for the boy, you know. I'll do no such thing with Owens and me having a lovely little tomb over by the daffodil patch. Plenty of room in there for little one. Anyway, she added, concerned that Silas might when she was rejecting his hospitality. I wouldn't want the lad disturbing you. He wouldn't. The boy was done with his banana. What he had not eaten was now smeared over himself. He beamed, messy and apple-cheeked. Narna, he said happily. What a clever little thing he is, said Mrs. Owens. And such a mess he's made. Why, attend you little wriggler. And she picked the lumps of banana from his clothes and hair and then, What do you think they'll decide? I don't know. I can't give him up. Not after what I promised his mama. Although I have been a great many things in my time, said Silas, I have never been a mother, and I do not plan to begin now, but I can leave this place. Mrs. Owens said simply, I cannot. My bones are here, and so are Owens. I'm never leaving. It must be good, said Silas, to have somewhere that you belong, somewhere that's home. There was nothing wistful in the way he said this. His voice was drier than deserts, and he said it as if he were simply stating something unarguable. Mrs. Owens did not argue. Do you think we will have long to wait? Not long, said Silas, but he was wrong about that. Up in the amphitheater on the side of the hill, the debate continued that it was the Owenses who had got involved in this nonsense rather than flibber gibbet Johnny come lately's counted for a lot, for the Owenses were respectable and respected. That Silas had volunteered to be the boy's guardian had wait. Silas was regarded with a certain wary awe by the graveyard folk, existing as he did on the borderland between their world and the world they had left. But still, but still, a graveyard is not normally a democracy, 
and yet death is the greatest democracy, and each of the dead had a voice and an opinion as to whether the living child should be allowed to stay, and they were each determined to be heard that night. It was late autumn when the daybreak was long in coming. Although the sky was still dark, cars could now be heard starting up further down the hill, and as the living folk began to drive to work through the misty night black morning, the graveyard folk talked about the child that had come to them and what was to be done. 300 voices, 300 opinions. Nahima Trot, the poet, had, from the tumbled northwestern side of the graveyard, had begun to declaim his thoughts on the matter, although what they were no person listening could have said when something happened, something to silence each opinionated mouth, something unprecedented in the history of the graveyard. A huge white house of the kind that the people who knew horses could call a gray came ambling up the side of the hill. The pounding of its hooves called could be heard before it was seen, along with the crashing it made as it pushed through the little bushes and thickets, through the brambles and the ivy and the gorse that had grown up on the side of the hill. The size of a shire horse it was, a full nineteen hands or more. It was a horse that could have carried a knight in full armor into combat, but all it carried on its naked back was a woman, clothed from head to foot in gray. Her long skirt and her shawl might have been spun out of old cobwebs. Her face was serene and peaceful. They knew her, the graveyard folk, for each of us encounters the lady on the gray at the end of our days, and there is no forgetting her. The horse paused beside the obelisk. In the east, the sky was lightening gently, a pearlish pre-dawn luminescence that made the people of the graveyard uncomfortable and made them think about returning to their comfortable homes. Even so, not a one of them moved. They were watching the lady on the gray, each of them half excited, half scared. The dead are not superstitious, not as a rule, but they watched her as a Roman augur might have watched the sacred crow's circle, seeking wisdom, seeking a clue. And she spoke to them in a voice like the chiming of a hundred tiny silver bells. She said only, the dead should have charity. And she smiled. The horse, which had been contentedly ripping up and masticating a clump of thick grass, stopped then. The lady touched the horse's neck and it turned. It took several huge clattering steps. Then it was off the side of the hill and cantering across the sky. Its thunderous hooves became an early rumble of distant thunder and in moments it was lost to the to sight that at least was what the folk of the graveyard who had been on the hillside that night claimed had happened the bait was over and ended and without so much as a show of hands had been decided the child called nobody owens would be given the freedom of the graveyard mother slaughter and josiah worthington bart accompanied mr owens to the crypt of the old chapel, and they told Mrs. Owens the news. She seemed surprised by the miracle. That's right, she said. Some of them don't have a, a harpeth of sense in their heads, but she does, and of course she does. Before the sun rose on a thundering gray morning, the child was fast asleep on the Owens' little fine tomb, for Master Owens's had died the prosperous head of the local cabinet makers' guild, and the cabinet makers had wanted to ensure that he was properly honored. Silas went out for one final journey before the sunrise. He found the tall house on the side of the hill, and he examined the three bodies he found there, and he studied the pattern of the knife wounds. When he was satisfied, he stepped out into the morning's dark, his head churning with unpleasant possibilities, and he returned to the graveyard to the chapel spire where he slept and waited out the days. In a little town at the bottom of the hill, the man, Jack, was getting increasingly angry. The night had been one that he had been looking forward to for so long, the culmination of months, of years of work, and the business of the evening had started so promisingly, three people down before any of them had even had a chance to cry out, and then, then it had all gone so maddeningly wrong. Why on earth had he gone up the hill when the child had so obviously gone down the hill? By the time he had reached the bottom of the hill, the trail had gone cold. Someone must have found the child, taken it, and hidden it. There was no other explanation. A crack of thunder rang out, loud and sudden as a gunshot, and the rain began in earnest. 
The man, Jack, was methodical, and he began to plan his next move. The calls he would need to pay on certain of the townsfolk, people who would be his eyes and ears in the town. He did not need to tell the convocation he had failed. Anyway, he told himself, edging under a shop front as the morning rain came down like tears. He had not failed, not yet, not for years to come. There was plenty of time, time to tie up this last piece of unfinished business, time to cut the final thread. It was not until the police siren sounded and a first and first a police car, then an ambulance, then an unmarked police car with a siren blaring, sped past him on their way up the hill that, reluctantly, the man Jack turned up the collar of his coat, put his head down, and walked off into the morning. His knife was in his pocket, safe and dry inside its sheath, protected from the mystery of the elements.